Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. This is the midweek supplemental edition. Uh, This is episode 161. That feels good to say for some reason. 161 of these opportunities to listen to me bloviate, which is, uh, which is, uh, well, that is for you to have. In any case, coming up on the Knife Junkie podcast, uh, today we're going to be talking about a couple of new knife drops, uh, one from uh, uh, Invictus, one from Two Sons, one from uh, Tops. We're going to be talking about a couple of other uh, stories in the in the knife world. I'm also going to talk a little bit about my No New Knives November moratorium, which, which, uh, as we record is uh, suddenly in effect and 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 I kind of kind of forgot what the date was and well in any case uh, there are a couple of carts that are going to be uh, left unattended on the internet for the next month uh, but before we get started I want to talk about the town hall we have coming up November 14th Saturday November 14th at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time live on YouTube uh, you know our town halls it's an opportunity to uh, meet and greet uh, the knife makers you love, the guys and gals who are making the knives that you love. And uh, this time we have TJ Schwartz, designer of uh, uh, many great knives. Um, one I actually have in hand right now through the Pass Around group, this uh, CRKT Overland, which is just an awesome, awesome budget knife. Highly recommend it. Uh, but he's also responsible for other things, uh, uh, other things that you know and love, like the Kona Garius. He will be on. We have Alex Steingraber coming on. He's uh, He's hit the scene hot recently, and uh, we had him on the podcast here, and he's a, a really great guy doing very interesting things with steel and heat treat, and he's really a, he's a knife maker that is uh, honed in on one model right now uh, on the whole and uh, is using that model as a test bed for heat treating and different steels and everything, and he's just burning it, burning it up, pun totally unintended. He will be on. We have Lance Abernathy, uh, the uh, man behind Sniper Blade Works. We just spoke with him recently on the podcast. He'll be coming on. Uh, and, I mean, okay, I guess I can say this straight across the board. Great guys. Another uh, like wonderful human being that I spoke to on the show here uh, who has a really excellent line of uh, five of the custom knives he made at one time, or four of the custom knives he made one time, and he has a, a fifth, the Smatch It. Uh, coming out in this line, but he he has a small production line that's gone back up, Sniper Blade Works, and it's uh, being funded through a uh, through a, a crowdsourcing. And he will be on. Very cool guy. Very interesting and uh, robust tactical knives. And then we have the uh, great and powerful Ernest Emerson coming on. Um, he will be here to talk about his work, and we can all ask him questions. And uh, uh, you know, I'm a huge Emerson fan, so I'm very excited about that. And uh, I'm a lifelong Emerson knife fan, lifelong meaning as long as I've known about Emerson in my life since the late 90s. But uh, since meeting him and talking to him a couple of times, I'm a fan of him as a person. He's a really cool guy. So uh, check out the town hall Saturday, November 14th at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time live on YouTube for TJ Schwartz, Alex Steingraber, Lance Abernathy, and Ernest Emerson. And I've asked them all uh, to report in from their workspace. So I want to see where th- where the sausage is. I want to see where the knives are made. So uh, uh, I think other, I think viewers will enjoy that too. So uh, check that out, the town hall. Uh, next, I want to talk a little bit about this thing I've been talking about, No New Knife November for me and uh, and what that means. And, and you are not hearing this on November 1st, but we are recording this on November 1st. And I woke up having been to a fun Halloween party uh, at some people in my bubble at their home. And uh, this morning I woke up and I was like, oh, no, it's November 1st. It's like it all happened in slow motion. And I remembered the shopping cart I had open on uh, uh, Blade HQ and uh, <laughs> and on um, uh, Smoky Mountain Knife Works. I was just not much. I wasn't going to spend a lot of money, but I figured, look, these are things I might want to get in before No New Knife November um, officially starts. And by get in, I mean, it's like a postmark. You know, if I purchased it before the beginning of November and it came in in November, that would be fine. 
So I had to set up that opportunity for myself and then and then sallied forth to this party and forgot all about them. So can't get those knives now. I got to I got to stand by it. And and here's the thing. When I decide to do something self-righteous like this and then announce it to the world, that's usually is the only way I can keep to it. Otherwise, uh, the justification machine moves in and uh, I start thinking about, well, if you know, we are in troubled times and what if I need to trade knives for food? And then, you know, as soon as I'm on that thought, those shopping carts fill up and uh, well, you know what happens then. In any case, so no new knife, knife November has begun, and uh, I'm going to stick with it. And the whole point is to is to slow down and take a look at the stuff I've already acquired, figure out what I want to keep, what I want to get rid of, and just kind of live with it. Uh, I mean, how many times have you been on a roll? You've gotten some; it's gone in your pocket. You've been really enthusiastic about it until that next box comes, and it's like that liner our good friend Terry reads. Um, so I just want to avoid that for a minute, just a minute here. It's like. It's like um, sometimes it feels like it's more about the anticipation of the box arriving. And then you pull up and you see the box and you're like, that anticipation peaks as you pull in the driveway and look at the front stoop and see the box. And you're like, oh, it's here. Cool. I know it'll be awesome because I've been looking at it on you. Okay, cool. I wonder what's going to come next. I wonder if there'll be a box here tomorrow when I pull up. All right. Well, I do call myself the knife junkie. So, I mean, that is part of it. So. Uh, that anticipation thing, it seems weird to me. It seems a little, hmm, uh, not completely under my control. Maybe it's a little impulsive. And I think maybe, um, you know, as you get older, you have to burn off some dead wood. And I'm going to see if maybe this impulsive thing I can handle, get rid of, and have it be more about just, you know, acquiring the special thing here and there. I know, broken record. You've been hearing me say this for two years now, but it's still how I feel. So there you go. I'm trying to at least take action or inaction in November. So there you have it. Uh, you may have noticed recently on the channel, we have a, a new show and we're, and we're not going to be doing this regularly. It's more like a new special and it's called the deep cut. And, uh, the first one came out on Friday. It was with Jimmy Slash. And what the deep cut is, it's, it's an opportunity for me to talk to great knife friends, and go down the rabbit hole about a, a specific thing. With Jimmy Slash, we talked uh, about XL cold steel folders. That's how I, I, I got to know Jimmy because it was before the purchase of some cold steel XL folder. And I looked online who, you know, who had a review and I noticed uh, he had a trove of them. So uh, I, I, I fell in love with his channel. He's a great guy. And uh, uh, when you're watching his videos, it feels like you're hanging out with him and he's a very pleasant guy to hang out with. So I said, why not have him for the first deep cut? We'll go deep. <laughs> we'll go deep in um, Cold Steel XL folders and talk about him for up to a half hour. If we go any longer, it becomes a different show than it's Thursday Night Knives or it's something else. I want this to be a concentrated uh, um, moment in time where I get to talk to one of my favorite people about one of my favorite aspects of knives. So the first one, Jimmy Slash, XL Cold Steel Folders, that came out uh, this past, uh, last Friday. And then coming up soon, maybe this Friday, maybe I'll put it out the following Friday. Um, but I have one with my good friend, Ian Lewis, who was on the interview show this past Sunday. And uh, he was originally, he was on number eight podcast. He was my very first interview. And we talked about, uh, um, knife combatives and uh, escalation of force and different uh, aspects that go into the tactical end of knives and knife owning and wielding. Uh, he and I did a deep cut the other day. Uh, we recorded it on Bastinelli knives. He is a, a big fan of the Bastinelli knives. I am too. And I'm a big fan of Bastian Coves, the man behind the blades. And uh, so I figured why not talk to my, my good friend and expert in knife combatives about this awesome, awesome knife line. And so we did that. That'll be up in the next couple of weeks. So deep cut, it's an opportunity to get, you know, to really geek out hard about one little aspect. So uh, let me know what you're interested in hearing deep cut wise. Uh, you know, what do you want me to go deep in? It's not necessarily, uh, I might, it might be something that I don't know about or don't have an expert to go to, uh, but let's see if we can do this. 
shoot me some ideas. What do you want me to have a deep cut on? You better believe I'm going to be doing some deep cutting on uh, traditional knives. Uh, I, I, I have uh, an expert in the field and purveyor coming on the show uh, uh, in a couple of weeks. I don't want to blow that yet, but uh, uh, so that should be interesting. Uh, I've also been talking to another legend. I haven't been talking to him. That's not true. Mm. I've been DMing back and forth with another legend in the slip joint world. And uh, boy, it would be awesome to have him on the show. I wonder if you know who that is. Uh, so let's see if we can figure that out. So the deep cut, let me know what you think. It's been a lot of fun, the first two shows, and I look forward to doing the others. Uh, so yeah, as I mentioned this this week, it's uh, Ian Lewis. And I just want to mention, it. this is a we've done a number of these kind of uh, interviews and we've also had a number of these kind of guests on our town halls. And what I'm talking about are not knife makers or designers or manufacturers, uh, but operators or users. And by operators, I mean, we've spoken to military guys and, uh, but also we've spoken to a number of uh, highly accomplished uh, martial artists like, uh, like Michael Janich, like Ed Calderon and like Ian Lewis. And to me, these are very interesting conversations because uh, they always burst a bubble that that builds up in my head uh, between these kinds of conversations when I talk to experts about um, tactical knife use. Uh, I, I I make no bones about it. I'm a, I'm a man of uh, aesthetics. I like the way things look and feel. And man, you know, I love a knife that looks like this. I love something that is really, you know, decidedly combative and nasty looking. And I like carrying them. And, uh, you know, I, I've done a bit of training in my past. I haven't done it in a little while, but uh, that is part of that natural part of me that draws me to knives. So I'm interested in talking to people who, who for their living and for their, their entire passion is combatives and this kind of thing. And um, so having that conversation with Ian this past week, uh, it was a great refresher. A, to remind me, I need to get off my my tuchus now and and get some private lessons with Ian and get my stuff back up uh, to to par. But also, um, you know, it might be something to fantasize about. It might be fun in those in those unguarded moments where you're like, oh yeah, draw my knife, and I'd say, hey, you know, leave me and my family alone, and they would scatter. But this is not a joke, and it's so it's great to talk to these people. They always remind you that it's not a joke uh, from their very experienced and you know higher view. So anyway, uh, that's, uh, I just wanted to address that kind of interview. You might, you might be someone who likes collecting, uh, slip joints and you, and you keyed into us recently because I've been talking about them a lot. And then you hear a podcast and we're talking about, uh, you know, untoward knife topics. Well, that's the reason why. And I just wanted to mention that. Uh, and before we get into life knife news, that's the, that's where we take a look at the new knives coming out. I just wanted to mention Patreon and take a sip of water. Thank you. Uh, so we started a Patreon account a couple months back. We've had great response. We have some great friends of the show um, who have become members of Patreon. And um, we have three tiers. The $3 level, that's the traditional junkie. We have the $5 level, that's the tactical junkie. And then we have the $10 level, and that is the gentleman junkie. And ladies, and I know there are many of you listening to this show and watching this show, uh, that doesn't mean you're you're precluded from the gentleman ju uh, junkie tier. That is just uh, a reference to the gentleman folder, you know. So uh, the people at the $10 level get uh, entered into a, a, a monthly knife giveaway. So that's, that's the real USP for being a $10 Patreon member. Uh, but if you think uh, the weekly interview show with, with uh, luminaries from the industry and uh, a Wednesday supplemental where I just jabber on and a Thursday night knives where you can jump in and, uh, and be a part of things or, or the, um, the town halls we do where you can jump in and be a part of things and actually talk and meet with uh, knife makers. If you think that's all worth <clears throat> uh, some money and you have a little extra scratch, I would be honored. Jim would be honored if you could help us uh, support our efforts here. So that's it. That's the hard sell Patreon. We have a page. Check it out. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast, and now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. So we're back with Knife Life News, and uh, um, before we get into it, I just want to tip my hat to Benjamin Schwartz uh, over at 
uh, Knife News. He's awesome. I love his writing. I mention it all the time. I mean, he can he can really write about a new real steel and make it sound awesome. I mean, not that it's not awesome, but you know, he he has a way with words and he can turn the mundane uh, when it comes to describing knife design. He can turn that into an opera. I love it. So definitely check out Knife News. That's where we get a lot of our knife drop stories. And uh, I asked him once to come on the show and he's like, he, he very uh, he very graciously declined a busy, busy man and and that kind of thing. But uh, I'm going to ask him again because I would love to chat with him if, uh, you know, I'd love to chat with the brain that writes these articles. Check them out. They're 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 awesome. But anyway, uh, from Knife News, uh, new the new Invictus uh, folder. Uh, the Invictus design is something that people have gone absolutely bonkers over. I think it's I think it's really cool. The um, uh, well, ProTech has made a version of this design, and uh, it comes from Patrick Ma. Patrick is the guy behind, one of the guys behind Triple Lot Design, and then he left Triple Lot and um, started a couple of other companies recently. And 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 the one that we've been mentioning a lot is Terrain 365, and their whole um, unique selling proposition is the fact that they make knives that are impervious to water. I mean, so Patrick Ma, from what I know about him, uh, Prometheus Design Works, Terrain 365, Tad, uh, as you may have guessed, is an adventurer. And uh, so part and parcel to his knife designs now is a quality that uh, will endure even more than other knives completely waterproof, robustly built and completely waterproof. So how do they do this? A lot of titanium in the, in the works and in the, and in the handle, but the blade, uh, they use a, they use Teravantium, which is a uh, proprietary uh, cobalt alloy, I think, dendritic cobalt alloy. I'll, I'll say the words, don't know what they mean, but uh, in that dendritic cobalt alloy is not the proclivity to rust. So he puts this in his knives and Terrain 365 has a couple of really, really cool ones out there. One of them right now is the shoot knife, which is uh, based on the loveless shoot knife design. <laughs> really, really cool. But this Invictus AT uh, G10 that's coming out is a G10 version of the Invictus. And the Invictus was, uh, well, since its inception was a fully titanium frame lock folder. Um, and uh, as Patrick Ma describes uh, or, or explains, when he's out on an adventure, he actually really likes the feel of G10 or, or micarta on his handle because it's grippier. And uh, also there's that, that warmth factor. If you're anywhere cold and you have a full titanium handle, it's just going to be like you're holding a piece of ice while you're cutting. Uh, so he had intended all along to make this uh, uh, Invictus with G10 or some other material on the handle. He's done it. And... Uh, Man, it looks really cool. It's coming out through uh, Terrain 365, and uh, it's lightweight because of that G10, and uh, it's got the Teravantium. So, I mean, you can take it on your adventures. Now, for me, it's my adventure to Wegmans or 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 maybe to the local park, but still, I don't want my my knife to rust there either. So, I don't know. I, that, I, I got to be totally 100% honest. I'm warming up to that design. It is one of those designs that takes me time, whereas something extreme, something like this, takes no time at all. It taps right into my 12-year-old boy. Uh, but the something about the Invictus, it's more of a mature design. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, and so like the Sabenza, which I originally thought was just kind of boring, um, but have grown to love. I think the same thing is happening with this Invictus design for me. So. Uh, I saw pictures of this with the black, uh, the gray, and and the olive drab G10, and uh, it looks it looks really nice. So I think all you uh, all you Invictus fans out there will love the black or uh, will love the G10 version. And well, if you're a true Invictus fan, it is a moral imperative that you pick one up. Okay, next two sun knives. Two Sun Knives has a new knife out, and it's odd to see a news story about it because, like many of these um, knives coming out of China, but especially Two Sun, they're incredibly prolific. They just keep rolling out new designs and new models, and and uh, Two Sun has an odd, or well, I'll say odd, an unusual uh, marketing um, scheme or or selling scheme. They they have a a channel on eBay, and that's basically it. 
for the for the primary market. That's where they that's where they sell their stuff. And models come and go, and they're named by their um, they're named by number TS whatever. And they're design. They have a, a a nice stable of designers who are making very unique and interesting looking knives. Very complex builds beautiful builds. And I know that because they've been loaned to me and we have a lot of uh, fans of Tucson knives on uh, Thursday night knives, but how do you keep up with them? This is my question. Uh, how do you keep up with them? And it's been suggested, you know, I say that over and over. Uh, it's been suggested that I, uh, I reach out to one of the designers like Jelly Jerry or Wong Design right here in this story. Uh, this is the new knife coming out from them. And what's the very first thing you think of when you look at this Wong Design knife? It's called the little crocodile, by the way. I'll wait. I'll wait to hear. Just kidding. I won't. To me, it looks very much, and not in a derivative way, not that they're trying to rip off the design, but to me, it really is reminiscent of the old Spartan Harzy folder. And uh, well, I welcome more knives that are reminiscent of this. Not that I want anyone to rip off this design, but it is a spectacular and very simple design. And to me, this knife here, I'm going to try and orient it in the same fashion. I don't think I, yeah. Well, this knife kind of echoes some of those lines, but let's get to the little crocodile. So this thing, uh, it's interesting because Benjamin mentions in this article how Tucson has, um, has a way of putting out knives that have very uh, high-end handle materials and construction with uh, blades that are uh, beautifully ground out of steels that are not as high end as the handle material. And I think that's an interesting thing to go for a titanium handled knife with a 14 C 20 N 28 N blade like you have here. But I think the design is, is really nice. It's a three and a quarter inch blade. It's got a big thumb stud so you can sweep it out that way. You can flick it out that way, or it has an extended tang here. Uh, oh, I'm moving my mouse around, but you can't see it. It has an extended tank, so you can front flip it or slow roll it uh, out the front. And uh, it's just kind of a standard drop point blade, uh, as far as I know. And it's got a really nice inlay. That's another, um, uh, what do you call it? Element you'll see frequently in Tucson knives. Beautiful inlays and different kind of complex handle, handle builds. And uh, so anyway, I just wanted to show it off. Looks nice. Looks reminds me of the Spartan Harzy. And uh, is that a bad thing? No, I don't think it's a ripoff or anything like that. But uh, uh, that just popped into my mind. And uh, any opportunity to show off my Knife Junkie Edition Spartan Harzy. One out of one right here, baby. Love it. Curtis Iovito, gentleman and a scholar. And a sniper. Uh, okay, so next from Tops Knives, we have the Storm Vector. That's how you have to say that name. Storm Vector. It's a giant sax. It's a 12 inch bladed sax with a quarter inch slab, uh, you know, made from a quarter inch slab of 1095 steel. And look at that thing. I mean, you know, typical Tops quarter inch 1095 slab with the with the coating on it and uh and you got the micarta handles and and all of that and 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 all that that implies in terms of build but look at that i don't know i'm sorry i, I think that that is a spectacular looking knife and i think that for a while i was kind of like i love tops but there are other knives i got to branch out i got to try some other fixed blades and you know i have others <sighs> But every time I try and quit, they just keep pulling me back in. Look at that thing. You know me. I like the sax. I like the straight edge. And I don't have anything close to that size uh, when it comes to sax style blades. So I'm kind of thinking I should get it just so that I can share it with you so that uh, you can figure out if you need it. So what do you think? Is that a good enough justification? Uh, I think it is. So maybe the storm vector is on my horizons. Uh, one thing that uh, sticks in my craw a little bit, and it's totally out of necessity, it sticks in my aesthetics craw is, and I don't have a picture of it right here, is the sheath. It's one of those open-backed sheaths that you get with knives that have, or large knives that have uh, a lot of bulk at the front, like a kukri or something. Um, maybe not a kukri, but like a, uh, like a, like a John Brown tracker style or something that has a lot of mass and a lot of broad, uh, a lot of breadth 
at the top front of the blade towards the tip uh, that narrow out towards the handle. Well, you have to accommodate that in, in, a, in the sheath naturally. And oftentimes the way to do that is to have an open spined sheath where only down at the bottom with the first two or three inches uh, does the sheath go all the way around the tip of the blade. And then it, so it allows you to, when you, when you unsnap a tether or you unsnap a retention strap up towards the handle, then you can pull it out instead of drawing it from the sheath, you're kind of backing it out of the sheath. All of that being said, you know, that is obviously the way to have, to have that done. Tops knows what they're doing. I just don't like the way it looks. What does that make me? Oh, don't answer that. Don't answer that. But it would be cool to have a leather kind of sheath for this. And Tops, I know you don't do leather. Well, that's not true. You do do leather. But it would be cool to um, have it in some context, a larger context. You know, you have the leather and the smaller, smaller knives. Um, it would be cool to see a big leather sheath for that thing. Anyway, uh, that rides sideways on your back like a Viking. Because it's the Storm Vector and it is of giant sacks. So very cool knife from Tops. Next, after I take a sip of water, I want to talk about a new story that I saw a couple of times in a couple of different places. And it's just freak, weird, disturbing, and just, you know, related. Mm. So in the Philippines, a very blade-heavy culture, uh, a, a police officer was recently killed during the raid of a cockfight. Now, cockfighting is a legal sport uh, in the Philippines. And, uh, but they made it sort of illegal during coronavirus and, you know, they have a pretty, um, pretty, they have some pretty st strict ways of governing and, uh, well, they, they, uh, put an end to the cockfights during coronavirus, uh, which I bet the roosters were happy about. And, uh, you know, when, as you can see in this picture here, cockfights aren't just two, two roosters fighting. They, they actually attach blades to the legs of them spurs they call them and oftentimes they're on the they how i see them oriented right here on the back and they they do the kicking and the gouging and the, and the tearing and the ripping and then they one of them one of them lives and the other one dies and i bet the one that lives isn't isn't happy but probably happy he's alive in any case uh cops come to bust up a a a, a, a cockfighting ring and one of the police officers uh gets gets nicked in the, gets cut in the femoral artery with one of these damn blades on, on this chicken and dies. He dies from this cockfighting. Um, well, I'm not going to moralize here, but I, I don't, I don't like anything where you take two subjugated uh, entities and force them to fight one another for your entertainment. I think it's horrible personally. Uh, but you know, uh, what can I say? Some, some cultures, don't believe what I believe. Uh, and in this case, uh, you know, like dog fighting to me, it's abhorrent. Uh, having a dog that knows how to fight isn't, but, but being a, having a dog that can, you know, dog fighting is gross. Cock fighting is gross. And here a policeman paid the ultimate price, uh, for this. Anyway, I think it's kind of horrible. And, uh, I just mentioned it cause it's a blade story and it's a freak story. And, I don't know. I, I don't mean it as an opportunity to get on my on my soapbox. So there you have it. That's my opinion of cockfighting. I'm sorry to hear that that police officer died from that bull crap. Anyway, here we go. Let's go to the state of the collection. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. So I want to talk a little bit about... Uh, since we're going into new night, new night, new no knife November, and I'm gonna, I said we, I meant I, because this is ridiculous. I wouldn't, I don't think anyone else should do this. It's not good for your psyche. It's not good for your spirits. But uh, this is my forty. This is my thirty days in the desert here. So uh, one thing uh, I plan to do is kind of really take a close look at what I have and 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 appreciate it, and then the stuff that I just that I'm only appreciating on a mental level, like, yes, that's a very interesting design. And I'm glad I have this to complete my you know, my, my, my collection, that stuff I'm going to try and get rid of. So, you know, I've been on the traditional kick lately, the, the slip joint kick lately, and I'm, I have decided on what my very favorite pattern is. <laughs> a look inward. <laughs> I love that, Jim. Uh, my, uh, 
I've decided what my very favorite pattern of GEC and possibly uh, slip joint knife is, period. And it is the GEC 86. So, you know, I got one recently for myself and for my brother. One for his birthday and one for me being such a great brother for getting him one for his birthday. And uh, I got us matching um, tortoise shell versions because my brother really instilled a love of tortoise shell, or maybe our love grew at the same time as we both grew and fell in love with electric guitars and the pick guards of electric guitars, that tortoise shell. And then we both got the glasses and, you know, other things. And uh, so when I saw this, I thought I have to get this uh, and get one for Vic. But the reason that uh, this actual tortoise shell knife really uh, made me gaga is this tool setup. I love, absolutely love the main blade as being a Bowie, but I love this shape, that shape of the Bowie. There are two different, uh, you know, GEC does this, that's their higher end Bowie shape. And then they do this, which is, on their more worker working line. And I love them both. They're both beautiful, but something about this uh, uh, machine ground swedge, they call it. I don't know if this is hand ground or what the deal is, why they call this machine ground. And that long pull and the sort of recurve on this blade is, is very uh, compelling to me. And then my second favorite blade shape in the world and especially on traditionals is the Warncliffe. It's really, it is the most usable, I think, I'm, or the most useful, I should say. So I'm a sucker for a jackknife, and a jackknife is uh, gets a lot of kind of definitions, just like you can have a modified reverse tanto, whatever the hell that is. You can have a bunch of different kinds uh, of, of, uh, of Warncliffs. And uh, in this case, wait, was I on Warncliffs? I'm sorry, <laughs> I just lost that. Uh, so yeah, just like you can have all different kinds of modified blade shapes, uh, the this, this uh, Warncliffe style is definitely the most useful for ripping open packages, ripping open, I don't like that expression, for, for incising into packages. And the jackknife, which is what I was talking about, is generally a, a blade that has multiple blades that come from one side. Um, you can have a single bladed jack, um, that's what I was getting onto, all these modified blade shapes. Well, the, it's the same thing with jackknives and traditionals. You can have a, the, the regular jackknife is two blades coming from the same pivot, but you'll get an equal end jackknife uh, with, with, not, with blades on both ends. So somehow that's a jackknife, but it was always defined to me as coming out of the same side. So that's what I like, all right? That's my long way of saying that. But the 86 is the perfect, uh, incarnation of it because it has the um, the Bowie and it has the Warncliffe. Now I have a couple other jacks here that I want to show uh, that I really, really love, but, uh, but have all been eclipsed by this 86. And I have two of them now because I found one in this beautiful bone material. And this is my favorite, my favorite uh, material for a handle on a traditional knife. So here's one, uh, this is the 44, the GEC 44. It's a gun stock, you can tell by the shape of that. It looks like a gun stock from an old rifle. Uh, this has the pen blade and the uh, clip point, which is probably my second favorite uh, uh, tool set. This is a another jackknife with an interesting tool set. You've got a Warncliffe, really useful blade. This one's called the Beer Scout, or the Crown Lifter. And uh, it's got a Crown Lifter screwdriver. Another great setup, but not quite the 86. And then my favorite GEC knife of all is this number 15, set up like a trapper with a spay blade. My favorite knife overall, yes. But uh, my favorite tool set, no. So this is the kind, <laughs> okay. You're gonna have to suffer this for a month. This is the kind of uh, thing I wanna look into uh, over the next month. Like, why do I really, and then am I gonna keep all the other jackknives? The answer is yes, but the, it should bring the question up. You know, is it worth keeping the other jackknives? Because in other situations, uh, you know, if I start talking about Stockman's, is it necessary to keep all the Stockman's I have? And the answer will probably be yes to that too, but there are other knives that I can do that too. And damn it, I'm gonna do that during November. And you're all gonna applaud me for how disciplined I am. 
Thank you. And scene. All right. So as we move forward, I just want to talk about uh, Dave, our good friend Dave, this old sword blade reviews uh, on YouTube and a good friend of the show and of Thursday Night Knives. He just donated three knives to the channel, um, kind of in the uh, in the same spirit as Stu, who donated two knives that we used for giveaways. Uh, we're going to do the same thing here, except one of the knives he gave, he gave three knives to the channel. One of them I'm going to foster, you know, like you foster a child or a dog. Um, it's this, Cold Steel Immortal. Immortal. Of course, it's a folding version of the Roman Gladius, and yet they call it the Immortal, which is weird because it's kind of a reference to the Im Immortals, the, the, the Persian guard, special elite, whatever. But the immortal, in any way, in any case, kind of is evocative of that sort of sword and sandal movie. And I, I love this thing. So it is very interesting because this is nothing but a Tanto plus. You know, you've got, yeah, let's see. You've got, oh, that's too much light. Sorry. You've got the Tanto here. And then you've got that whole top portion above with that swedge. So I am wondering, I, I want to figure out, the reason I say I'm fostering this is I'm very curious. I'm not just taking a new knife because it's been donated, but I'm very curious as to how this setup, like, is this an improvement on the Tanto, on the Americanized Tanto with that giant swedge on top? Is that going to make it a much better penetrator and thruster, which is what regular American Tantos are already known for and uh, heralded for? I mean, is this... Is this an improvement and it's just going to come and go? Because the Immortal is, uh, I think it's discontinued. So, I mean, it's, that's what I want to get into. So I'm going to foster this Immortal and I'm going to see if uh, see what's up with this blade shape. But first, I might have to have that tip reprofiled by Mr. Jared Neve because it's just a little, just a little wonky there. But uh, interesting. It, it will be knife research and that's what we're all about here. Well, not really. Uh, so that knife came in, uh, this, we were talking about Tucson earlier. Check this out. This is the Tucson TS 16, and it's a bit of a rare bird. I'm told, uh, by uh, Dave and, uh, check that out. It's got a cool clip it, from this perspective. It looks a bit like a bag kind of ball style clip. Um, but obviously it's not. And, uh, that handle, man, that stepped handle shape is really comfortable. And uh, so Dave indicated that to the Tucson collector, this might be something people uh, are interested in. Great action, you know, all the Tucson stuff. Uh, I like that blade shape. You know, when I look at this knife, I'm going to be I'm going to be totally honest. I look at this knife and uh, I'm like Salieri. I'm like too many notes, just a little too many notes. Um, but I love the blade design. Like, I don't need all that. I don't need the venting. I got to be honest. Uh, does it lighten the handle? Maybe, maybe a titch, but no more than a titch. Maybe a, maybe a skosh, uh, but uh, I just don't really like it. And I don't really like the echoing of that here for no apparent reason other than aesthetics. So it's just not my aesthetic. That's all. It's beautiful knife, beautiful knife, beautiful blade, awesomely built. I, Tucson, they're a mystery. Uh, everyone's like, no, they're not, Bob. Stop saying that. But to me, they are. Here you go. Off-grid. Off-grid knives. This is something I've been hearing about recently quite a bit. They've, uh, it's a new family-owned business that has a, a at least two tiers, I think, of, of um, value level. Like this is an OS 8 um, steel liner, liner lock G10, sculpted G10 with an extra lock in a very unobtrusive place, I might add. Uh, this thing is built like an absolute proverbial tank. You got a, a glass breaker back here. This is a, uh, I haven't done anything with it yet and I don't think I'm going to because we're gonna auction it, but uh, I'm pretty impressed with these guys uh, with this build. And uh, I do know that uh, Off Grid has a model or two that's made by We. Like I think they have different manufacturers make their knives, but they are an American family owned company, which is always something that, uh, is pleasing to me. I mean, I, it's always interesting. I want to, I want to find out more. I'm inviting them onto the show to talk about uh, this outfit. But uh, this is another one uh, loaned to it, not loaned, donated to us by, by Dave. So we're gonna, we're gonna do something with it, auction it, or sell it, or you know, do something, 
and then the proceeds will go to knife rights. Uh, the day that this airs, the election has happened, and I'm sure it was totally unchaotic, and I bet there was like a really easy transition of power, and, and, and everything is now uh, resolved, but I'm sure that didn't happen. But uh, in any case, uh, Knife Rights is going to get the, the proceeds to anything that comes out of here that gets sold or auctioned out of here in the next couple of months, just because, you know, um, we want to make sure that we have our knife rights. So that would be a terrible thing to lose uh, as absolute junkies of the knife thing. So there you have it. Uh, I wanted to mention that the last knife that came in before NNKN, you know that as No New Knife November, was this. And it, I think it's a bit of a beauty, and I want to show it a little bit. This is the uh, this is a sunfish model or pattern. Sunfish is also called an elephant toenail or toenail or elephant toe. Uh, they call it a lot of different things, but this is a Rough Rider, as you can tell. And um, uh, it's got this beautiful blue dyed bone over black G10, so it kind of darkens the blue. And uh, they do a they do really nice job with their bone. I got to say, Rough Rider does. And uh, and the transitions from the nickel silver bolsters into the wood, I mean, into the uh, bone are seamless for what, 20 bucks I paid for this, maybe a little less, 19 bucks. You get a little bit of gapping. Wait, yeah, a little bit of gapping between the springs and such. You can see it like running right there. Interesting thing about this knife is that unlike most sunfish I've ever seen, it is a Warncliffe sunfish. So this is approximating a Warncliffe. Well, they both are. They both have a slight curve to the blade. This has more belly, obviously. Uh, but these are Warncliffs on a sunfish, and it's a it's a cool combo, I think. I like it. And, uh, well, this was the last thing to come in before No New Knife November. Let me just show you real quick this compared to the only other sunfish I have. And this, this looks way more typical. Uh, with that blade set up as opposed to that pretty neat well i'm excited to dive into this we'll see uh i've acquired quite a few rough riders uh over the past couple of months because they're so easy to acquire and uh I, i'm thinking that uh another part of no new knife november will be figuring out which ones i start throwing in, in packages when I sell a knife or when we do a knife giveaway, uh, they're great gift knives because they, they don't hurt you to pick up and uh, they are really good quality knives. So great gifts. So I'm gonna start giving those things away. Uh, anyway, I think that brings us to about the end of the show. I just wanna say that uh, uh, hopefully November is a good recalibration, reorientation time for me and uh, as I do this, as I look back into my collection, as I start to think about culling, I'm not going to make any promises because I do that all the time. And then uh, I find a reason to keep the knife. But uh, as I start honing things down, I, I will be talking about knives that I've had in the collection, in my collection for a while. And, uh, you know, maybe haven't gotten the spotlight. And I've noticed Knives that are gifted to me that I haven't expected that, that I haven't thought I wanted, or knives that I've gotten by chance or were so cheap I had to had to buy or whatever. Some of those weird knives that I don't expect I'm gonna want end up being my most used, most favorite. Here's an example before I dip. Look at this little thing. Just a tiny little single bladed shred, cheap hollow ground slip joint. And this thing's on my desk and it gets used all the time. So I'm going to start talking about those kind of things, uh, you know, uh, just knives in the collection that I haven't really dipped into. And uh, yeah, let me, let me know what you think. Let me know what you think. Am I, am I being, am I being too, is this morbid self-reflection? Let me know. All right. So that about does it for this edition of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Midweek supplemental. I hope you are all well, all staying safe and sane and uh, you know, Use your best judgment. And uh, for sure, no matter what happens, do not take dull for an answer. 
Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.